So would you say this game is better than Brink? You know, it's one of the few games from 2011 that actually is. 2011 sure was a year in gaming. Well, I mean, Minecraft released uh, again. PlayStation Network was down longer than the economy. Wii U was pretty much just fun to say. And the 3DS bombed, but it yeah, kind of Yeah, it did. kind of didn't. My name is Brian Belita, and I'm a portly Asian steampunk gentleman with a pompadour. And I'm Imran Khan, and I'm Nerd Wish Fulfillment. And we're here to take you on a wondrous journey through Brian's Gaming of the Year 2011. In just a bit, I'll get to my PC Gaming of the Year selections, but I'd like to start with the top console games that I played in 2011. If you've listened to the beer cast at all, then you probably know I'm relatively easy to please. Not to mention the fact that you're too indecisive to actually select the single game of the year. Well, luckily, so many great games came out this year, even on PC alone, that my choice to be indecisive wasn't even a question. I refuse to place I Divine Cybermancy over Deus Ex Human Revolution. And that's why I've strayed away from a game of the year video, and instead wanted to give a rundown of my year in PC gaming in no particular order. I Divine Cybermancy was a game that came out of absolutely nowhere. An incredibly ambitious first-person cyberpunk RPG, it lacked the polish to truly make it stand out, along with obvious translation issues. This is the kind of game that benefits from its four-player co-op, if only so you can laugh at you and the brosefs every time it pops up on one of your screens. Next up is a game that Mark Bradshaw consistently pronounces incorrectly. Super Mario Brothers? Nope. Batman RM City? Nope. Naruto Ultimate Ninja Storm? Wrong again, Imran. I'm talking about, by and large, one of my favorite games of the year, Deus Ex Human Revolution. Not Deus. DEHR is one of a few number of games that truly absorbed me into its world. The art direction, the characters, the clothing, the music, the story. It's the entire package. I'd find myself taking a break from knocking out unsuspecting bad guys and hiding them under vending machines in order to inspect every corner I could explore and simply appreciate the attention to detail. Yes, there's the boss fights thing, but I'm not one to let that ruin such an immensely enjoyable gaming experience. Speaking of games with fantastic visuals, Bastion, for one, is a shining example of art direction over quote-unquote better graphics. It doesn't bring anything particularly new to the action RPG table, but instead carves out its own place with an enchanting story, solid gameplay mechanics, and a metric butt-ton of heart. Now let's move from one form of artistic expression to another. Good idea. Let's head to a game that defines itself through the forbidden art of slump jumping. Brink. What can I say about Brink? I had a great time with it and think it's deserving of more praise than it may have gotten. There's the brilliant smooth movement across random terrain system and it introduced some fresh ideas to the multiplayer shootman's arena that, while complicated, didn't overwhelm the player. That said, I wish the game had a more focused single player campaign that wasn't just multiplayer battlefields with bots. I absolutely love the world that Splash Damage created, and the game simply oozes style from everywhere. I crave to see additional Brink in a more guided single-player setting along the lines of Deus Ex or Bulletstorm. Or Dark Spore. What? No, not like Dark Spore. I thought you liked Dark Spore. Yeah, but... You'll hear me refer to Dark Spore as the best game you almost certainly didn't play in 2011. A co-op action RPG can almost never go wrong in my book and Dark Spore differentiated itself by having a three-swappable hero system for when certain heroes would be better suited to go up against certain enemies. It of course had fantastic character customization, but suffered from an overabundance of the preset heroes that you could choose from, and a cumbersome loot management system to boot. But didn't it also have that great trailer where that little kid got thrown backwards out the window? No, it didn't, Imran, but I'm glad you brought it up. There's really not much to say about Dead Island. It's the best up-close zombie murdering simulator bar none. Yes, there are guns in the game, but unless you're a specific character whose specialty is guns, they're by and large useless. The devs clearly wanted to focus on melee combat, and man does it feel good. It's deliberate and highly rewarding. Once again, co-op is king, and Dead Island is definitely far better enjoyed with friends. I'm noticing a distinct lack of Mirror's Edge on your list, despite the fact it came out in 2008. You know, they never did release that Floaty Island DLC for it on Steam. Well, what about a Marriage Edge Substitute that's not from Concentrate? There was one game this year. 
Every so often, a game comes around that awakens the wild speedrunning time trial beast inside of me. Last year it was Nimbus, this year it was In Momentum. A game completely dedicated to Quake 3 chick jumping esque mechanics? How could I pass it up? It's got cleverly designed levels, a great sense of speed, and presented in such a way that it's approachable even by those who maybe didn't grow up on a hearty diet of rocket jumping. In Momentum looks neat and all, but what I really need is a momentum based game with higher production values than what an indie team can offer. Well then I have one question for you. How do you feel about potatoes and potato based alternate reality games? You know goddamn well how I feel about potatoes. If a game's rating were determined by how late I stayed up for its release and how much sleep time it cut into on a workday, Portal 2 would win everything ever. It's a concentrated dose of super fun gameplay, mighty detail, fantastic characters, and quirky humor. The fact that it launched with both a single player portion and an equally as long but completely separate co-op campaign is an immense achievement given the mechanics, as well as what the norm is for video game releases. There's nothing not to love about Portal 2. It maintains quality all around. If only there were a game that had a high quotient of hoes and maintained sex toy based weapons all around. Oh hoo hoo! Well let me tell you about Saints Row the Third. I like Rock Paper Shotgun's description of Saints Row the Third being simultaneously wickedly smart and phenomenally stupid. The game has an easy to follow and access main storyline, while also leaving an entire world of ridiculous possibilities at your fingertips. It's a game that relishes in simply being fun and not taking itself seriously. It took a hit from having a sizable lull in the middle of the game, but pushing through was well worth it once the over-the-top story mission started again. If your favorite thing to do after beating a GTA game was to hop back in and raise as much chaos as possible, Saints Row 3 is a game that takes that to the nth degree while really coming into its own. I hope there's more on this list than Shootman games. There are, but goddamn were there a lot of Shootman games. Well, what about any rhythm-based RPG dungeon crawlers featuring music by Ronald Jenkins? Oddly enough... We talked about Sequence back when it first came out. Imran gifted me a copy on Steam, and it walked right into the Rhythm Gaming Surprise of the Year. Loot, crafting, and items in my music-based game? It's more likely and better implemented than you might think. I thrived on frequency and amplitude in college, so this was a welcome return for the plethora of pop music peripheral-infused rhythm games today. My college experience is more thriving on bad pizza and Top Gear. The American version? Jesus, no. The British version. You know where they also speak with British accents? Space. Space Marine was my first real foray into anything surrounding the Warhammer 40k universe, and hot damn was it a fun one. Fictional universe aside, Relic managed to take an approach to the third person shooter that all but forces you to wade into hordes of orcs in order to regain health. But really, a game about being a badass 7 foot tall 3 ton genetically engineered space marine put here for the sole reason of mashing orcs couldn't have been done any other way. But what about games where you play some sort of dopey 16 foot tall giant in a loincloth who herds mammoths for mammoth cheese? Unfortunately, you can only be lizard wizards or cat people in the Elder Scrolls V at the moment. So how is Skyrim anyway? Is it any good? Foos Road, duh! I've tried plenty of open world RPGs before. Some, like Fallout 3, I stick through to completion. Sadly, with others like Gothic, Risen, and Morrowind, I have a bad habit of simply stopping about a quarter of the way in. Luckily, Skyrim and I got together like Gabe Newell and the Color Red. I'm susceptible to being overwhelmed with choice, but this game seems to have struck the perfect balance for me. It helps that the combat system is fun and engaging, reminding me a lot of Dark Messiah of Might and Magic. Bethesda has done a stunning job in creating a huge living world, and I want to experience all of it. So from myself, Brian Belita, myself, Imran Khan, and the whole Nitro Beard crew, let's, let's dive, dive into 2012. Well.